Thanks, Tom. Thanks for the invitation as well from IPPR to speak today. The title the organizers have set is The Economy After Brexit that you've been discussing all day. The immediate challenges of Brexit have been magnified, I have to say, a hundredfold by this decaying government. This afternoon in Parliament will be on our first day of the committee stages of the whole House of the Bill and will be ensuring that people recognize that Labour respects the decision of the referendum last year, but we cannot support the toxic combination of incompetence and ideology that this government have brought to the process. We face the biggest political challenge in this country's recent peacetime history, with a government, well, barely capable of agreeing amongst itself on any given day of the year let alone in negotiating properly with the European Union and its member states. We are, as a result, rushing headlong into the worst-case scenario of a no-deal Brexit in which a sudden and catastrophic change to our regulatory and legal environment is imposed upon us, with no real preparations or plan for how to deal with it. To delay or even refuse a transitional deal until a final deal is agreed is an appalling dereliction of duty by this government. So I tell you that Labour will fight every step of the way for a Brexit that puts jobs and living standards first. And we've insisted that the rights of EU nationals currently resident are agreed immediately. Not only is this the right thing to do, it will immediately drain the bad blood that the Conservatives' belligerence has built up in the negotiations. But we also need to look beyond the immediate crisis that this government is creating. If we're to steer our way through the fog, we need a clear direction on where we want to get to. But we also need to understand where we're starting from. So the truth is that the British economy's woes run much deeper than merely an incompetent government. The IPPR have posed the question today, is the economy working for all? I think it should be clear that the economy as it stands is working for almost nobody. Real wages are lower today than they were in 2010. We're living through the longest sustained decline in living standards on record. And the younger you are, the worse the decline becomes. Insecure work is up one third since 2010. There are now three million jobs in the UK where there's no guarantee of hours or employment rights. And Britain has the dubious privilege of being the only major developed economy where the economy has grown, but wages have fallen. This is just an extraordinary poor record. The government, after seven years in power, has to learn, well, has to learn to take responsibility for it. We've said it before, and I'll say it again. If the current government is not prepared to radically change course on the failure of the last seven years, that's ending austerity, delivering investment across the country, working with, not against our European partners to secure a proper Brexit deal, then Labour stands ready to take over. But you know, the rock stands, well, runs deeper than the Tories' mismanagement and incompetence. The IPPR's Commission on Economic Justice has already done excellent work in highlighting the deep, long-standing structural flaws of the British economy and it is a superb piece of work so far. Flaws in the economy that as the Chancellor scrabbles around to try and patch together a budget, now become unavoidable. The collapse in productivity growth, the shrinking of investment, and the feeble amounts that are spent on research in particular. The creaking infrastructure, the gross, well at times grotesque regional inequalities by some distance the worst in Europe, the huge concentration of riches at the top, with the top 5% now owning 40% of the nation's wealth. I also have to say sets of institutions from the Treasury to the city that are simply not geared up to delivering the economic policy and strategies that a modern economy needs. When we go into government, we'll have an extraordinarily difficult job on our hands, we accept that, but not just in addressing the social, even humanitarian crisis of austerity, and. That's not my description, but that of the Red Cross. And not only in turning around the economy so it delivers for the many and not the few, but in addressing those gross inequalities and long-standing structural failings. In some cases, these failings have been allowed to build up over decades. So an entirely new approach to economic policy making will be needed. 
one that places the needs of the many ahead of the profits of the few, one that seeks to transform the old institutions and build new where they're needed. And it's this, to this deeper question that I want to turn. Because of the failings of this economy, like economies across the world, they stem directly from an approach to economics and economic policy that fixates it on the short-term returns rather than, and it misses, the long-term damage. I believe that neoliberal approach has now been exhausted, whatever potential some once claimed for it. The countries and governments that cling to it, like this one, are tired and incapable of setting a new direction. They cannot hope to meet the challenges of the, next, the new century. One of these central challenges is reconciling the extraordinary potential riches of our economy and all of our people with the constraints imposed on us by the planet we share. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference continues this week in Bonn, as you know. We all welcome the international effort to rein in global carbon emissions, and international action is urgently needed, and Labour is completely committed to work with others to meet this country's obligations. The expert consensus on climate change and our impact on the environment is absolutely clear. Unlike our current environment, Secretary, we take these international obligations seriously. I have to say, this is an environment secretary who tried to remove climate change from the school curriculum when he was education secretary, an environment secretary who's notoriously suspicious of experts and who's been part of a government that's overseen fracking across our communities, including in our national parks and now illegal levels of air pollution that have escalated into what the House of Commons Select Committee has called a public health emergency. Labour are calling for the entire body of environmental EU law and treaty principles to be transferred to UK law. But the truth is in that meeting these fundamental legal and moral environmental obligations we recognise will be a challenge. We can't rely on marginal adjustments or tinkering around the edges anymore. It will require a transformation of our institutions and how our economies are run. At the most abstract, the problem that we face can be stated very simply. Every 1% added to global GDP over the last century has meant, on average, adding 0.5% to carbon dioxide emissions. As the size of the world economy has grown, so too has the pressure it placed on our ecosystems. And the consequences of that pressure are now becoming all too apparent. 2017 is likely to be in the top three of the warmest years on record. And the other two, 2016 and 2015. And on current trends, we're heading for a 3.5 degrees Celsius increase in global temperatures this century. A rise that could wreck, well, everyone's economy. This isn't only about climate change. Other fundamental natural systems are at risk as well. One third of the world's soil has already been degraded. In the UK, the Committee on Climate Change estimate that 84% of our topsoil has been lost since 1850. At this rate of decay, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that the globe has only 60 years of farming left. What biologists call the sixth mass extinction event is the Earth's, in the Earth's history is now underway. Half the world's species of wild animals have been lost in the last 40 years, and this pressure is growing rapidly. Of the total volume of carbon dioxide and methane emitted since 1751, half has been emitted since 1984. The impact of humanity on, planet, on the planet accelerating since 1950 is now so pronounced that it's claimed we've entered a new geological age of the Earth, the Anthropocene, Anthropocene age. Rapidly rising concentrations of carbon and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, deforestation, other habit loss, and mass extinction. They're all combining to put an end to the relatively mild climactic conditions humanity has spent most of its existence under. Planetary change requires more than small-scale marginal adjustments. It requires concerted public action on a scale that meets the challenge. As the IPPR Commission on Economic Justice has argued, market-led approaches like carbon trading have failed to deliver. What we need instead is to take a radically different approach, repurposing old institutions and building new ones. 
We need to rethink the very purpose of economics. Growth for the sake of growth alone no longer works. The usual claim for growth in gross domestic product, GDP, is that it means over time a steady increase in living standards. It's close to unarguable that the standard of life for most people, particularly in the developed countries, has improved beyond recognition in the last 200 years. This improvement has never been the product of markets alone. From the early years of industrialization, it's regulation and public action that has restrained the pure profit motive. It was the factory acts in Britain that first started to restrain the sheer brutality of early industrial capitalism. Child labor was barred, working hours reduced, some measures of safety and control steadily imposed on workplaces. These are the historic achievements of the early labor movement. And it was far-sighted local authorities who built modern sewage systems and controls on pollution. It was the labor government who massively expanded the provision of health care through the NHS and decent quality housing through its house building programs. At every step, the invisible hand of the market has been restrained and at times guided by the visible hand of public democratic action. If we have a more humane society today, it's because of that public action, not despite it. The expansion of production, the sheer increase in the volume and the quality and variety of products that capitalism has produced has lifted living standards, of course. But it took public action to ensure those products were more fairly distributed and the environmental impacts of their production restrained. But today, the engine of growth appears to be malfunctioning. The transmission mechanism from in increase in GDP to rising living standards appears to have broken down. This break has been the most spectacular in those developed countries that turned most sharply against the enlightened belief that the engine of growth worked most effectively when it was steered and managed. So whilst GDP per person in the US doubled between 1970 and 2008, average wages have hardly moved. And in the UK, since the crash, GDP has risen, but wages are today lower than they were in 2010. Government policy since that date has been to be frank, utterly ineffective. For all the rhetoric, most people today are worse off than they were when the Tory Chancellor first arrived in 2010. And not only do they know they're worse off, the numbers of people expecting their situation to get worse in the future is the highest ever recorded. So the machine is broken, and I think everyone knows it. We've campaigned up and down the country for the last two years, away from the few bright spots clustered overwhelming in London and the southeast, you'll find the same story everywhere. It's one of potential wasted, in dead end, insecure jobs in parts of the country, starved of investment. We've seen an improvement in GDP, but a decay in the quality of life. We've allowed for a very few extraordinary riches, but let the institutions that allow genuinely civilized society to function to wither away. The NHS is in a state of crisis again. Our schools face funding cuts for the first time in decades. Cuts to our welfare system creating, well, destitution. 400,000 more children will end up in poverty over the next few years, and 40 million, 40 million people in Britain live with illegal levels of air pollution. We're living in what the great American economist J.K. Galbraith once described in private affluence some public squalor. It's a dereliction of the duty of government to claim, as this one attempts to claim, that growth, feeble as it is, justifies their claim to office and their economic policies. Or to them to claim our people should be grateful for whatever miserable, poorly paid, insecure drudgery masquerading as work that they can get. We, have to, we just have to lift our sights now. We need an economics and an economic policy with a moral purpose. We cannot continue in the old way. Climate change alone guarantees that. We have to now lay out a different path. To be clear, a belief that GDP cannot be the sole metric doesn't mean a rejection of technology or material progress. This is not about throwing out the advances of the last two centuries or more, quite the opposite. It's only by applying the products of science and technology that we can hope to meet the challenge of climate change. A planet of seven billion people and a country of 60 million must find new and better ways of working and living, not hanker after some mythical past. 
and it's the accelerating pace of technological change that's placing in our hands the very possibility of making this change. But we need a government that understands this point and is prepared to act on it. That means a government with a sense of moral purpose and strategic clarity that's built into its economic approach. So our industrial strategy has identified two national missions, closely following the approach suggested by the work of Mariana Matsukato and her researchers, who you'll be hearing from later. The first is to radically decarbonize our economy, setting a strict target of 60% of energy from renewable sources by 2030. The second is to transform Britain into a leading high-technology country with the greatest proportion of high-skilled jobs in the OECD. And yes, 3% of our GDP spent on research and development by 2030. This approach, establishing a broad but clearly defined national goals, means moving industrial strategy beyond what historically gets dismissed as picking winners. But it's a, tr it's a tribute to how far the rot of neoliberal thinking has set in that only in Britain is picking a winner considered a bad idea. Everyone else just gets on with it. It is, what it, whether it's Japan's new robotic strategy or the huge support given by the German government to, to promote the industrial internet, by continuing to pretend that the market and only the market can make major strategic decisions about our economy, we are not only an outlier amongst the developed nations, but we're falling further and further behind. So the next Labour government will establish these two missions at the centre of our economic policy. They are different goals, but in reality they're inseparable. Information technology already accounts for 7% of global energy use. As the volume of data outline, online increases exponentially, and as we move into the next few years from a world of 3 billion online citizens to 4 or more, that share will only increase. But research from the OECD shows that the countries with the highest use of information technology are also now gradually decreasing their emissions. The steady move away from fixed information technology into smaller, lighter, less energy intensive mobile devices is already helping reduce carbon footprints. Greenpeace have shown how major tech companies are taking steps to reduce the colossal energy requirements of their data centers as vast volumes of data move out from personal and company service and onto the cloud, the efficiency savings here could just be immense. But beyond simply greening what we have, technological advances offer a way to radically overhaul how we produce and consume. The spread of mobile technology, artificial intelligence, and advanced sensors mean that resources can be used as efficiently and as effectively as possible. This is the internet of things, putting computer intelligence into the objectives, objects that surround us and connecting them to the global network. The number of connected devices is growing at an extraordinary rate, from 15 billion devices globally today to a forecast of 75 billion by the middle of the next decade. And the consumer impacts of this are, are most obvious and sometimes so far perhaps a little superficial. But the Internet of Things holds out the prospect of a far more profound shift in how we organize our economy. This is about much more than having fridges that can tell you when you need to buy more milk. It's about the possibility of building a sensitivity to the environment in how we produce and how we consume. It's about meeting the challenge of climate change and environmental degradation head on. So in agriculture, sensors in the ground already allow the precise monitoring of soil moisture and acidity. Drones allow the monitoring of crops 24 hours a day, and more precise monitoring means more data, which means that water and fertilizer use can be optimized. Early studies show that energy costs for US farms using technology fall by almost a third per hectare, and water use for irrigation drops by 8%. Smart interconnected devices offer the prospect of helping to transform our energy system as well, radically decarbonizing our economy. There is today the prospect of creating for the first time a responsive energy system. Historically, electricity must be consumed when it's generated. If demand rises, more supply must be found from producers. For renewables, essential if we are to decarbonize our energy system, this creates an immediate problem. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. But there is a need for significant backup power only, some part of which can come from renewable sources like tidal power. But with a responsive grid, this relationship needs no longer apply. Smart metering already enables 
a more efficient use of electricity sources in homes and offices. But as sources of electricity become more distributed, and as the ability to monitor demand becomes more fine-grained, new possibilities open up. So the battery in your car, when standing idle, when your electric car is standing idle and plugged in, could be used to also supply the additional demand needed elsewhere in the system, as well as radically improving the air quality our children have to breathe. Or home solar generating a surplus for the household can transmit back into the grid to meet demand elsewhere. One study by Ericsson estimates that by 2030, global emissions of carbon dioxide could be cut by 63.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide through interconnected devices. That's equivalent to a huge 18% reduction in existing use from this technological shift alone. For manufacturers, the efficiency saving in smart production has the potential to reduce global carbon dioxide by about 2.5 gigatons annually by 2030. And manufacturing is already transforming itself, as many of you know. 3D printing and industrial centers, they're making production more responsive to consumer demand and shrinking its economic scale. I went to the Advanced Engineering Show in Birmingham last week. It was fantastic. It was just a fantastic event. It was showcasing advanced manufacturing from across our country. The potential from so many smaller companies is just enormous. You can see the applications of new technology in augmented reality headsets, robotics, and artificial intelligence. These are smaller manufacturers here in the UK, building some of the most advanced technologies in the world. The geography of production is shifting once more. One in six UK manufacturers report moving some production back to the UK. And there are huge advantages in locating where the skills and markets are. But making this technological shift happen and taking advantage of all this will require huge collective, yes, public action. We'll need to dramatically increase our national investment in research and development. We'll need a sharp focus on those areas where the UK has, been, has a clear advantage. And the Committee on Climate Change identified a number of those areas in the UK, which, yes, where we do have a significant advantage, a competitive advantage, like electric vehicles, energy storage, and low-carbon chemical processes. But this shift cannot happen in institutions that, however well they worked once, are no longer quite fit for purpose now. Labour has always been the party that created new institutions, from the NHS to the Open University, down to the recent Sure Start centres. We've been the party in the past with the vision need to see how the challenges of a new age can be met. So today, we've committed to establishing a strategic investment board at the top of government. This board will bring together the Chancellor, the Secretary of State for Business, and the Governor of the Bank of England, plus representatives from the National Investment Bank and business. It will be charged with delivering a major increase in productive investment across the whole country, but focused on technology. It will be served by a secretariat with a focus on using the best available data and metrics to inform decisions in line with the next Labour government's overall industrial strategy and we'll provide support for worker-owned and cooperative enterprises, faster, smaller, and more nimble than the industrial giants of the past. We want to see a flourishing cooperative enterprise across the whole country, making use of new technologies and, yes, restoring prosperity. We'll create a right to own for employees where a change in ownership is made, giving them the first refusal on putting forward a plan for worker ownership. But alongside building new institutions, we'll work to give those that we already have a new sense of moral purpose. Lord Bob Kersley prepared a report for us on the Treasury, our central economic institution, and we'll be looking as a priority to implement his suggested reforms. But over the last few years, the Office for Budget Responsibility has established itself as an independent, authoritative voice on economic analysis. So the next Labour government will guarantee and reinforce that independence by making the OBR report not to the Treasury, but directly to Parliament. We want thorough and genuine oversight of our own fiscal plans. We want the public, whether businesses or voters, to be absolutely confident that the public finances are properly scrutinized and managed. But more than this, we want to make sure our plans reflect our values. We want a moral purpose to be brought into the center of economic policymaking. We want to ensure that the overwhelming challenge of climate change 
is addressed from the very centre of government. So the next Labour government will ask the OBR to include the impact of climate change and environmental damage in its long-term forecasts. The Bank of England has already begun stress testing financial institutions for the ability to cope with climate change. We need to take the same far-sighted view of the public finances. The public deserve to know what impacts we might expect on the national purse from the degradation of our environment. Sound, responsible economic management should already be accounting for this. So we'll make sure that the OBR has the resources needed to produce the best available modelling of the economic impacts of the environment. And we'll make sure not just the next Labour government, but future governments will be absolutely committed to addressing our greatest single challenge. We face as a nation the huge political challenge of Brexit. But beyond that point, we face as a species the potentially devastating challenge of the new age of climate change. Our old economics, fixated on crudely on increasing GDP, regardless of how it's done, can no longer apply. Our old economic policy, fixated on letting markets rip, regardless of their consequences, can no longer hold. Our old institutions must change. New institutions must be built. Labour understands this and will rise to the challenge. We'll build a new economy, radically fairer, more democratic, sustainable and egalitarian, where alienated and insecure work has given way to free and creative labour. The challenges are immense, but so too are the possibilities. We are up for it. Thank you.